This video is part of the topic evolution of life looks at the relatedness of the species and how do we measure that and how do we represent that. So one of Darwin's great insights was an understanding that even though there is a diversity of living organisms and species, that if you can look at their ancestry and fossil records that you can uh, see perhaps lines linking them together back to common ancestors and the idea that um, current species may have evolved from common ancestors uh, which linked them. And so the diagram here um, shows, he says here, I think this is how it might be, uh, that this uh, family of different species here, D, might be related to family B or C, through some sort of common ancestor that may also link back to family A here and that there's a connectedness or a tree of life which all of the current species that we see as uh, the tips of that tree may link together through these branches back to common ancestors and perhaps back to number one here some sort of uh, universal common ancestor. Uh, he was working in a time before genetics and this was really based on morphological studies. Um, as we uh, increased our technology and understanding, different ways of representing these tree diagrams came uh, about. Here is a uh, what we call a phylogenetic tree diagram, looking at different vertebrate species based on, again, morphological uh, characteristics here. And I'm linking relatedness. And so you can see from here that the mouse and chimp have a common ancestor here, whereas the pigeon and chimp have a common ancestor here. Um, and chimp would have common ancestor back to the fish here, uh, which was before the development of lungs in this evolutionary lineage, whereas everything after this point um, has lungs. And so uh, this is one way to connect relatedness through that form and function. Here is just uh, another lot of different vertebrates as well. This time, rather than sort of V-shapes, we have these squared off U-shapes. Um, this again shows uh, how there was a common ancestor here that would have split to create the cartilaginous fish and the bony fish with different characteristics again there. And we see different species of fish separated by this way um, and that the ancestor of birds and mammals and amphibians here is related to perhaps these lobe finned fish uh, that could have their lobes generated into, evolved into limbs compared to the ray finned fish uh, which are the ancestors of uh, regular fish that we see today. And so uh, this way of representing it shows that perhaps that species tend to uh, stay the same for a while and there are these big events that causes a split, um, sometimes referred to as punctuated equilibrium. Um, and the last diagram here is really wanting to take in all of life and has a similar uh, form to the previous one, but in this case we're putting it around a circle because it's so wide that we can't really represent it all. Again, here perhaps is back to Darwin's number one here, some sort of common ancestor right at the start of all life that would have split uh, initially into the types of uh, organisms that are related to us as, as animals here, um, and the other one being all of the bacteria. So the prokaryotes are over here. Um, in terms of bacteria, there's some prokaryotes here. These are archaea, uh, slightly different. And then all of these red ones here are the eukaryotes. And so we can see three main domains of life. Um, first two splitting here to become uh, bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes. And then here a split between the archaea and the eukaryotes. Everything on this red branch is then eukaryotes. And you can see plants and algae uh, are split from um, the slime molds, animals, and fungi here and animals and fungi having the most common recent ancestor there. And then of course, all of the different animals would be diversified from there and you could have sub branches that look more like this. So here are different types of phylogenetic tree diagrams that we need to be able to recognize and work with. So how do we understand them? Well, for a start on the tips, we have species uh, that exist currently. Going back in time, we have the ancestors of those present day species. And so A and B, uh, related species and they have a common ancestor at this point here. A and C are related species and they have a common ancestor back here and A, B, C and D all have a common ancestor here. And so as we look across we see variation. Uh, obviously at the point where they have a common ancestor they are the same and then as we go through time variation between A and B increases to the point where they're categorized as different species. And so we see variation arising over time.
um, and we can trace back to common ancestors. So there are a number of different ways of doing this. Like I said, um, Darwin would have used morphology. These days we use genetics. So how do we measure relatedness, measure time uh, in terms of relatedness? So changes in DNA accumulate over generations is the key thing here, that if we're looking at mutations or other uh, forms of difference, we can see how they accumulate over generations. So just take a very short segment of DNA in generation one, it might look like this. Somewhere along the line between generation one and 10, there's a mutation that has arisen, a change from a G to a C in this sequence. Um, and of course, all of the um, offspring and downstream uh, offspring from uh, this individual would inherit that change. So the ancestor had a G, everything from here on has a C. Perhaps by generation 20, there's a new mutation that has arisen. And again, all of um, the uh, offspring from here would inherit that new change. And so as each change is introduced across generations, um, that gets uh, incorporated into the DNA and we can see generations um, changing over time. So by the time we got to 40 generations away from number one, there might be um, four changes here. And so the more changes you see, the more generations there are between uh, individuals. And because, of course, when we looked at A and B, their common ancestor population would have all been within one gene pool, and shared um, the differences. So all DNA uh, would have been available to all of them. As they become two separate populations, uh, these changes that appear in population A wouldn't appear in population B because they're not part of the same gene pool. And so population A and B start to accumulate different um, changes in DNA. So they become more and more separate from each other at the same time as being more and more separate from the common ancestor. So when we look at these genetic changes, we're able to categorize relatedness based on the number of changes. We can do this with DNA, which changes fairly quickly. If you want to look at really long distances between relatedness, uh, we tend to look at proteins. So for instance, here's looking at the number of amino acid differences in hemoglobin polypeptide. Now just think about hemoglobin, it's part of red blood cells, it's very important for life. If you have mutations in hemoglobin, they're most likely going to cause it to not function, and therefore those species or those individuals wouldn't survive. And so changes in hemoglobin don't occur very often. Um, and therefore, even between macaques and humans, even though there's um, many, many generations between us having a common ancestor, there's only eight amino acid differences. And so because they accumulate very slowly, these differences, we can track a long amount of time. So back to dog, there's 32 differences, bird 45, frog 67, and lamprey 125. So when we look at that polypeptide, which is 100 or a few hundred um, amino acids long, uh, by looking at how many amino acids are different to humans, we can see how long it's been since we had a common ancestor with lampreys or frogs or birds. So genetic differences, accumulate over time. The fewer differences means the shorter the time since we had a common ancestor and that's what allows us to draw a phylogenetic tree. Um, as well as looking at uh, DNA sequences, um, we could also look at this process of DNA-DNA hybridization. So sorry, uh, the video is covering up a little bit there. Let me move that up. There we go. Um, so uh, hybridization is a quick and simple technique for comparing two species without having to do the DNA or the protein sequence. So for instance, species A and B are not very closely related. So if we make single-stranded uh, DNA and hybridize those or, or anneal those together, get those to bond, you'll see that there are a lot of base pairs that don't match up. They're not complementary, and therefore this doesn't create hydrogen bonds. It means that these two pieces of DNA are easy to separate by temperature or melt. Um, and so when we look at this segments of DNA, it's called a hybrid because it has DNA from two different species. We hybridize that together and we can see that they don't bond very closely and therefore they're not closely related. Whereas if species A and C are closely related, we'd expect a lot of complementary base pairing across this hybrid and therefore lots of hydrogen bonds form, which means it's harder to melt, so you need a higher temperature to separate those two strands. So by looking at the temperature required to melt the hybridized double-stranded DNA, you can see how similar those DNA sequences are, and therefore how closely related the species are. 
So DNA hybridization is a very widely used technique for looking at relatedness without having to do sequencing.